Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 16th, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page, and through our posts on Twitter. Because of the time we spent on them this week, once again, we only covered the first two of our top three issues. First, Michael and I discuss a series of tweets from Representative Ivy Sponholtz that says out loud what has historically been the silent part of the progressive position on PFD cuts. And second, we take on yet another ADN editorial board op-ed, pushing the top 20% position of making PFD cuts in other words, middle and lower income Alaska families, bear the full weight of government spending. Once again, we will pick up the third topic, the current status of Santos PICA project, and whether there's a silent but sitting behind their recent positive statements next week. And now, let's join Michael. This week, uh, we're going to start off with one, which is, uh, I, it was my favorite way for Brad to say it. It was essentially... Ivy Sponholtz is now saying out loud what's supposed to be the silent part, the part that's not talked about. Brad, what what are you what are you discussing here? What what do you got going on? Well, uh, as part of the budget cycle, uh, Representative Sponholtz uh, put out a Twitter uh, thread, uh, which is multiple tweets uh, stacked on top of one another to to sort of be a a, a dialogue or a or a discussion. Um, and, uh, and in the middle of that Twitter thread, she had one tweet that said this, a better way to help those who are financially struggling would be to invest in low income housing, public assistance, Medicaid, supplemental nutrition assistance, SNAP, senior benefits and other programs, which go directly to those who really need it. Um, and, and she was using this as a justification for cutting the PFD for, for, <laughs> for, 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 for limiting the PFD. Well, there's three things about that. I mean, that's, I just, I broke out into laughter when I, when I read that. Usually you don't see, you know, uh, the, the progressives being that open about trying to rationalize why they're cutting, why the, the rationalize the impact on lower income families of cutting the PFD. But there's, but there's three things that are just humorous about that. One is most of those programs are largely federally funded. Um, so she's taking credit. She's trying to take credit uh, for cutting the PFD to save programs that are federally funded, largely federally funded um, in any event. I mean, have very have something to do with state funding because, you know, the state funds part of those programs, but the largest part of those programs uh, comes from the federal side. So we're cutting your PFD. Right. Think about this for a second. We're cutting your PFD because the federal government is paying for a bunch of, of this assistance. I mean, that's, that's one thing. Right. And, and, and another thing about that is that things like Medicaid, the money doesn't go to lower income Alaska families. Yes, they get, they get medical services uh, as a result of that, but the money goes to the docs and to the, and to the, and to the medical community um, who, who are really the big defenders of, of Medicaid and, and other programs, uh, programs like that. So I mean, she's defending. She's defending cutting your PFD so more so money can continue to continue to go to docs. The third thing, the next thing is. <laughs> the, the, I'm the, just the, sorry. I just. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hey, this this whole thing. I just my brain is. I'm good. Blood is about to shoot out of my eyes. Go ahead. This this is why they don't say this silent part. I mean, they try to imply it, 
we're cutting the PFD to save you. To, right, to exactly. Save you. But but this is why they don't say it out loud because it's just ridiculous once you start going down into it. The, the next thing is, think about this for a minute. She's telling lower income Alaska families that we're cutting your public assistance. We're taking money out of your pocket in order to provide you these services. Public assistance is to provide assistance on top of the limited resources that lower income families have. It's not to make lower income families pay for those services by taking money out of their pockets and saying, well, the government's going to take the money out of your pockets, but guess what? We're going to give you a bunch of good stuff in, in exchange for that. That's not what public assistance is. Public assistance is we understand you've got limited means. We're going to provide some assistance on top of what you've otherwise got to, uh, to help you, to help you pull yourself up by, by your bootstraps here. She's saying, here, she's saying, we're cutting your PFD. We're going to make you pay for right. these, for these services that you're getting uh, by cutting, by cutting your PFD. So that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's the third or the fourth thing that, that you know, <laughs> or the fifth gets me or the going. Sixth. Yeah. And then the, and then the final thing is here. And here's the, here's the core of it. What's going on with PFD cuts, even, even if you take at face value this rationalization, what's going on with PFD cuts is the top 20% don't have to pay, right? The PFD cuts take a minimal, trivial percent share of their income uh, uh, out of their income to, to pay for government. Using PFD cuts to pay for government takes a trivial share out of the top 20%. What she's saying is lower income Alaska families Bottom 20%. Don't worry about it. We're taking this money for a good thing. We're going to give it back to you in the form of government services. And, and you should be you should be happy about that. Yeah, of course the money goes to the docs. A lot of the money goes to the to the medical community, but you should still be happy about it. you should still be happy about that, that. That we're taking all this money out of your pocket. Uh, it's it's a good thing. Don't worry about it. Who who's left out in that in that in that discussion? Sixty percent of Alaska families, the middle income. Alaska I was just going to say, yeah, the middle is all. You know, let me let me tell you what I read into this, Brad. This is this is when I read this tweet and uh, and I was looking at it and I was thinking, you're right. She's saying out loud what they want or what they usually remain silent about. But essentially, what she's saying is what we really want is we really want everybody to be dependent on these services and then we can administrate everything up from on high because now we wouldn't be so we're the elite we're the ones in charge we're the elites we know what needs to be done with this so leave us to our things and we will take care of the rest of you with all these other programs they it's like they want to re get you know leave a huge chunk of Alaskans dependent on all this government depend you know creating this government dependency as long as of course we we wouldn't be a Affected by that because we're the ones that are making the decision. We are literally the Politburo setting policy for the entire country at this point, and we're going to live a whole different type of lifestyle than you guys are down there. But that's okay. Don't worry about it because we're going to take care of you. If you want to help those that are financially struggling, you know, if you want to help those that are financially struggling, let's put some more money in their pockets and let them make the decisions. No, no, no. We're going to invest in all these things, the low income house. And it, you see how it's an investment. An investment somehow indicates that there's going to be some kind of return. The return is going to be more dependency on what you have going on here. Well, so, and you're going to get to pay for it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, You're going to get to pay for it because we're going to take money that would otherwise go into your pocket. We're going to take it out of your pocket and we're going to we're going to pay for all this stuff. I, it's just. I mean, the way the mindset that 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 you know we're 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 we're, we're taking money from you to save you—that's the yeah. mindset. We're cutting money that otherwise would go in your pocket, enable you to be you know be more self-sufficient, enable you to to have have a better a better life. We're taking that money away from you because we're going to save you with all of with all of these government. Never mind that you may not use those services. We're going to save you with all those government services and middle income Alaska. We got the top twenty percent covered because we're using PFD cuts, so they don't have to worry about it. The middle income Alaska families, too bad. You know, we're, we're taking money out of your pocket. You're not getting any of these services. Um, but but guess what? You get to contribute to it. Top twenty percent don't have to, but you get to you get to you get to pay for it. It's just. <laughs> It, it's insane. Just in, an insane rationale. Well, this whole thread, by the way, for anybody who wants to go out and read it, I'll post up the link in the chat room if you want to go out and read the whole uh, read the whole thread. But if you read this whole thread right now, 
what really got me was even the the previous uh, the previous comment uh, from Ivy uh, in the in the previous tweet. It basically said that a concurrence on this um, on this uh, piece would have resulted in spending more money on dividends than we spend on social services, Medicaid, and education for the entire state. Um, and that was Alaskans money by statute. And I mean, somehow that's a bad thing. Then the second point she makes is it would have quintupled last year's dividend amount because you followed the law. That just tells you that for the last three years, you've been taking three quarters of the dividend and now it's shown out. And then it would have forced massive taxes and, and cuts to next year in spite of this year's projected. Well, I mean, massive taxes and cuts. I'm all about the cuts, and I guess at least the massive taxes would have mean that uh, everybody would have paid something on it instead of just the lower and middle income Alaskans. I mean, I don't want to tax, but I guess I, I see it as a necessary evil at this point because you people can't pull your heads out. I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of where we're at. This whole thread is just is laid down with all this stuff. And it's usually why it's the silent part, right? Because once you lay it out there, you can you you just go picking through it and you go, this is just stupid that's a stupid argument that's a stupid that doesn't make any sense i mean and, and usually what they do is they just leave it implied right that we're re- that 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 the reason we want all this government is we're looking out for for lower income alaska families well you're looking out for lower income alaska families by taking money out of their pockets you're not you're not you're not helping lower income alaska families you're just taxing them heavily uh by take by taking their their pfd and then giving them back what you think they should have Instead of trusting them to take care of their own lives, it's a uh, well. That's yeah. the that's the crux of it, right? I mean, that is the politician's disease. They know better than you how to spend your money. That's what this whole thing has been about. We could give everybody a forty two hundred dollar dividend. We could give we could put a hundred million dollars into every voting district. But if we did that, then you would be in control, and we wouldn't. And we just can't have that. Children, let the adults talk. That's what this comes down to. Yeah. Or we'd have to, we'd have to make the top 20% pay, top 20% pay for part of it. And we can't have that either. I mean, my gosh, they would, they would rebel. They would push back. They would tell us we can't spend all this money if they had to pay part of it. Right. So it's, it's, um, yeah, it's a foolish, I mean, it's a foolish attempt at defending uh, what's going on here with, uh, with PFD cuts. And it, it, as, as you and I are both saying, you usually they usually don't put this out in public because once you do, you know you re- you realize how foolish this defense is, how bizarre uh, this defense is. That we know better how to spend your money. Truly, 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 they're saying that to low income Alaska families. We know better how to spend your money than you do. So so we're going to take your money. We're going to take the money that otherwise would go to you, and we're going to redirect it in the way in the way we think uh, we think you're better off. And even if even if a lot of it does go to doctors yeah, and, and, hosp- and, and the if, medical community. And if you're truly struggling, there are many programs for you to then take advantage of. I mean, this is Scrooge saying, if the poor, they should go to the poor houses. Are there no poor houses? Are there, are there no soup kitchens? Are there no, then they should just, if they should, they should just die if they can't do it. I mean, this is really, that's what she's saying. This is it. We can't create and, and, and let the economy go on its own. We can't get out of the way of it. So instead, we should pour all these monies into these programs to make more people dependent. And if you don't like it, you can go suck on the programs to make sure you survive. We'll hold on to the rest of the money because we know what's going on here. Yeah, I mean, exactly this, right. This is an astonishing piece. This, this really is, like you said, a glimpse into the inside of all this stuff. And it's one of the reasons why they probably don't say this very often. Um, and, uh, but it just absolutely, absolutely astonishing. Uh, Brad, I don't know if you want to comment on this. There was a, a, Suzanne Downing had a, a, a well-researched piece talking about the conference committee members. Did you happen to see that with the breakdown of all the contributions from, uh, from the various special interests to all the conference committee members? I did not, Michael. I saw it. I saw the headline, but I haven't had time to dig into the into the substance of it. She, I can imagine, but I. But oh I yeah, read. she she dives into it and really looks at each conference committee and their contributions to each one of them from special interests. And every one of these, le- every one of these, le- with the exception of I think one, uh, is receiving over twenty thousand dollars of support from special interests for their campaigns. 
I think one of them was 14 or something, but the rest of them were 20, 25, $26,000 in special interest money. And they're the ones that are going to decide what we end up with, uh, on the, uh, you know, on the dividend and everything. I'm, <laughs> you, you, yeah, I, the fix you, is in. I mean, that's, it's it. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, no, I mean, I was, I was, I, I would assume, I would guess that, uh, that some of that money is coming from the same, uh, interest groups that, uh, or the members who, uh, weighed in, uh, over the weekend, uh, uh, against the PFD who, uh, sent letters, uh, that Mike Shower could, <laughs> thankfully posted all of them. So you don't have to go very far to find all of the trade groups that weighed, weighed in. Um, and I got to admit, I was, I was hugely disappointed, uh, disappointed by that. I mean, it's, it's, it's that to me is the most blatant example of, of the top 20% against the rest of Alaskans uh, that, that I've seen. What, what was it, what they were concerned about was if they didn't use PFD cuts uh, to, uh, if they didn't use PFD cuts to, to fund uh, uh, government, that they were concerned that, you know, somebody was actually going to start looking to the top 20% to pay a proportionate share right. uh, of, of the costs of government. Um, and, and they weighed in and said, oh, no, not us. Uh, you know, cut those PFDs. Now, they couched it in terms of government spending, which is what the ADN's done. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that here uh, after the break. But they couch it in terms of government spending, that the PFD is government spending. And so we're against government spending. But, but you strip off that very thin veneer. And what was going on was, oh, my God, you know, they're about to they're about to save the PFD. They're about to you know, put money in the hands of middle and lower income Alaska families, which means in the future, if they continue these programs, they're going to have to look to the top 20 percent uh, uh, for a share of it. We don't want that. So cut the PFD. Uh, keep using, keep diverting the PFD to pay for the programs. And it was the most blatant example, I think, blatant example, I think I've seen of the top 20%, you know, turning out and saying, don't give that money to middle and lower income Alaska families, continue to use that to fund government. And sure as heck, don't look to us to pay a, to pay a, 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 an equitable share uh, of the cost of government. You know, what's amazing to me is you had all these organizations, particularly the state, the chambers of commerce, uh, and the business organizations that were up there advocating, I mean, these are business organizations. You think that they would want more money in the private economy so that the businesses could benefit from that. But instead, it looks like, again, you've almost got that top 20 percent split in the businesses. The ones that they're really advocating for are the big entities that are dependent on the government spend instead of the mom and pops that make up, you know, 85 percent of the businesses in Alaska, 90 percent of the businesses of Alaska. They're instead just protecting those top players who are receiving all the government lucre. I mean, you would think that a Chamber of Commerce organization would, of course, be gaga over the fact that they are going to put money back into the economy where it belongs. Yeah, it was it was interesting. If you go through all those letters, they all have language that more or less says we need to continue spending. You know, some would say essential spending or some would say, uh, uh, you know, uh, appropriate spending or spending for K through 12 or. There were various phrases that they used, but fundamentally it was keep spending, just don't distribute the money. And then they focused on don't distribute the money out uh, through, uh, through a PFD. Keep it back, keep it back inside government to pay for that spending instead of looking to all Alaska families uh, to pay for that spending. Uh, uh, keep, using it, keep using money that, uh, that means the middle and lower income Alaska families end up paying paying for government. So they weren't, they weren't fighting government spending. They were, they were in essence telling the legislature it's okay to continue spending on stuff that benefits, you know, the trade groups like ports and roads and, 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 you know, government programs that AFL CIO got keep government programs going that keep our, that keep, you know, government uh, employee numbers high, which is, which is our membership. They were, they were, they were all supporting the government spending. It was, it was the PFD that really activated them and really got them going. And that's all about, that's all about who pays for government. That's, that's got nothing to do with government spending. It's all about who pays for that government spending. Uh, and they wanted to, they wanted to make sure that it, that that government spending kept being paid for by middle and lower income Alaska families and the top 20% didn't have to. It is truly an indication of how much special interest rules this state rules this state. All right, Brad. 
before I really burst a blood vessel here, let's go on. To, <laughs> let's get, let's get on a tease for number two here before we go to break. Let's hit number two. Well, this seems to be like the weekly thing now. You know, pick an ADN editorial and 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 you know and beat up on it. Uh, but you know, they keep publishing them, so I'm going to keep. Uh, I'm going to keep talking about them. There's an editorial uh, from this from this last weekend uh, that that purports to take on Mike Shower and other uh, others for pushing for uh, uh, full PFDs, full statutory PFDs, putting putting money in the hands of Alaska families, uh, particularly middle and lower income Alaska families, uh, and uh, and and seeks to uh, rake Mike uh, Shower and others over the coals for it. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna rake instead rake the ADN editorial board over the Colts Ward. They they are, they've become nothing more than a top 20% mouthpiece. They're like, they're like all of the other trade groups that that weighed in this last week to push back on 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 the PFD uh, and to say, oh no, we can't have that. You know, we got the PFD is the best way to fund this, best way for us, the top 20% to fund it. The ADN's become nothing more, frankly, than just another trade group in that regard. And and I'm going to talk about why that is. All right, we're continuing with Brad Keithley, the weekly top three. Number two, the ADN editorial board is not your friend, I think is kind of the inclination here. They've become nothing more than a mouthpiece for the business-as-usual crowd in the legislature, the pro-government spend crowd. They are definitely an anti anti uh, private citizen group, as far as I'm concerned. They really have become... Just the spokes critter, it seems like for the uh, for the pro government side. Brad, what's your uh, what's your hot take on this right now? The, the part, and this is this is an AD, this is an op ed that was in the weekend ADN. Uh, the title of it is "Editorial: Even Drunken Sailors Know Better." Uh, the part that that really uh, uh, triggered me was the discussion of fiscal conservatism, right? And and attacking Shower and others, Senator Shower and others, for not being fiscal conservatives. The, the, the sentence in there that I that sort of summarizes that is, in a sense, it is morbidly ironic that a budget this large and irresponsible is the work of Senator Shower and others who claim the mantle of fiscal uh, conservatism. Well, here's the deal. I go back, I'm old enough <laughs> that I go back to William F. Buckley Jr., right? I, I grew up watching Firing Line, uh, <laughs> uh, B- Buckley's program on uh, PBS. On, uh, right? yeah. PBS. And reading National Review, I couldn't wait. I mean, I'm, here's a kid in West Central Illinois, a very small community in West Central Illinois, you know, sitting there, the perfect definition of nerd, sitting there every week, you know, waiting for his uh, a copy of National Review to show up in the mail and then consuming it from, from one end or the other. I, I grew up on this stuff, and I grew up on, on, on what defines fiscal conservatives. And Buckley, on one of his programs, I remember clear as, clear as a day, uh, said, look, I'm not. I'm not saying that that people shouldn't pay for government. Everybody should pay for government. Everybody should contribute to the cost of government. We have a moral obligation. You know, Buckley was a was a deep Catholic, had a deep Catholic faith, often talked in terms of moral obligations. Everybody has a moral obligation to pay for government. You know, and then he went. He, then then he went on to say, I don't. Be, I don't believe that 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 we should have much government. You know, I think government ought to be limited. Uh, that, 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 that government's in too many areas. Government's trying to do too many things. But, but everybody ought to, you know, whatever government we have, everybody ought to contribute equitably toward, toward the cost of government. So that's the, def, that's the definition of fiscal conservatism I grew up on, right? Right. That, that everybody ought to have, a, everybody has an obligation to contribute to the cost of government. The cost of government ought to be limited and by and by everybody having an obligation or contributing to the cost of government, everybody has an incentive to keep government limited, limited because it's coming out because the costs are coming out of their pocket. That's why you know that's why I keep talking about the top twenty percent not contributing. They don't care about the cost of government because they don't have skin in the game. They don't have to pay a significant part of it. But that's fiscal conservatism. Fiscal conservatism is limit the cost of government. And but make sure that everybody has a stake in the game. Everybody uh, contributes uh, uh, equitably toward the cost of government, and that's exactly what Shower and the others essentially were arguing for in this last week. They said, "Look, let's comply with the with the with the PFD statute. Let's get the hand the, the money that belongs to Alaskans uh, in the hands of Alaskans, um, and and make sure that you know we fulfill our obligation uh, in in that respect." 
Um, and then, you know, we'll look at the cost of government and we ought to pare the cost of government down. Uh, uh, but at least we're making sure that everybody gets their, gets their fair share. What the, what, the, what the ADN is concerned about is what that will translate into as oil prices recede, as the futures market tells us they're going to, what that will translate into is to sustain this government, everybody's going to have to contribute, that the top 20% are going to have to start contributing a share toward the cost of government. We're going to have to be true fiscal conservatives. We're going to have to have everybody stand up and pay, uh, contribute toward, uh, toward the cost of government. The ADN is, is, is trying to, is desperately trying to avoid that. They're desperately trying to avoid the top 20% having to contribute to the cost of government. Um, and that's not, I mean, they claim to be fiscal, that they aren't fiscal conservatives. What they are is elitists. I mean, uh, olig uh, oligarchs, uh, uh, you know, various other old Greek words that you could apply to this, crony capitalists. They want to shove the cost of government down on middle and lower income Alaska families and, and, and it's just, it's, it's ironic to see them claim that Shower and others who are true fiscal <clears throat> conservatives, who are trying to make sure that, that government is limited and who are trying to make sure that, that, that middle and lower income Alaska families aren't charged disproportionately uh, for the cost of government, that the cost of government are spread. Uh, it's, it's ironic to see the, the, the ADN and others claim that Shower and others aren't fiscal conservatives when in fact, Shower and others are living up to the William F. Buckley ideal of what fiscal conservatives are. Well, and I think what's interesting is this became the line of attack from many legislators uh, about, oh, mocking the fiscal conservatism of many of these things. And again, trying to lay the blame for the entire budget at the feet of these people. If you were watching the, the if you were watching the exchanges, if you were watching the budget debate, you saw Shower and company attempt to make many cuts to the budget. They put many amendments in that would have cut things from the budget. And it was always, oh, no, we can't do that. Oh, we can't do this. Oh, we can't do that. Uh, and so they attempted to be fiscally conservative and put all these cuts in there, but they were shot down at every turn. Now, theoretically, if we if we had gotten to this point and there was no full dividend on it, Every one of these people would have been lauding Shower and Company for voting for this budget because it would have fully funded their vision of everything that was going on. It is strictly because the PFD was in this bill that they are no longer fiscal conservatives. That's really the truth of the matter. Yep, exactly right. And, and the people who are making that claim, none of them are fiscal conservatives. Louise Stutes wouldn't know a fiscal conservative if it if it you know hit her in the head, a fiscal conservative principle that if it hit her uh, hit her in the head. You know, when you think about it, and, and I know he's been criticized for it, I know I get criticized for it, uh, but when you think about it, Shower and, 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 and others are really the only ones who have talked about equitable revenue schemes, right? Shower's talked about sales taxes. I don't think sales taxes are as equitable as we need to be, but Shower at least has talked about sales taxes. You know, Luis Stutes hasn't talked about sales taxes. Bert Stedman, uh, you know, harangues about if you don't cut the PFD, uh, we're going to have to have taxes. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, the top 20% is going to have to contribute to the cost of government. That's that's how this works. Uh, if you don't take money out of the hands of middle and lower income Alaska families uh, through, uh, through PFD cuts. And yeah, Bert, the top 20% might push back on you. They might say, wait, you're spending, spending $600,000 on diving boards, you know, of, of, of my money, of my, of, of, of my, you know, Top twenty percent money. You're going to spend money on that? I no, don't do that. But but as long as you can push the cost, as long as you can use PFD cuts to push the cost of middle and lower income Alaska families, the top twenty percent doesn't care. I mean, their reaction is diving boards. Oh, that's good. My kid, you know, uses the swimming pool once a year. He'll have a diving board. He can he can a new diving board he can use. I mean, it's it the, the true fiscal conservatives in the legislature are are Shower and others. What's unfortunate. Is that is since 2017, the PFD has got bundled over to the UGF side instead of staying staying in DGF where it had been up in 2017, and so now Bert and others are able to claim that 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 distributing the the PFD in accordance with the statute is government spending. It's not. If you go back and look at what Hammond originally intended, it's the distribution of Alaskan share uh, of the uh, of of state wealth, the, the Alaskan citizen share. Uh, of state wealth, and to cut that and pay for to pay for government 
is just taxing middle and lower income Alaska families uh, so that the top 20% can continue to get off, as Hammond put it, scot-free. Absolutely. And again, this is this is the main point of contention is that, and you mentioned Shower talking about sales, but he just didn't talk about taxes. He also talked about uh, cuts. He talked about, uh, you know, looking at the oil tax structure. He talked about it was a holistic approach. This was the same approach that the whole fiscal policy working group agreed to. And yet nobody has bothered to take a presentation on everything that the fiscal policy working group has done. And instead, they, again, keep picking that one thing out over and over and over again. Um, it is that was the only true group of people in the whole legislature was the uh, was the was the working group's plan. And yet nobody took it because because they don't have any interest in it, Brad, because it doesn't serve their agenda, which is we control the money. That's what the agenda becomes. We can, we control the money and the top 20% doesn't have to contribute to it. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's, I mean, that's it's, exactly it's a, it. It's a two part agenda. We control the money and the top 20% doesn't have to contribute to it because if they do, they will push back on how we spend the money. We don't want them to have to be in, we don't want them involved because there is, there are donors, there are contributors. We would have to listen to them if they push back on us. So we don't want them to have to pay. And the PFD is the perfect because it runs through the government because the government is essentially the fiduciary that's supposed to distribute it. It's the perfect thing to tax and and uh, and and use to pay for government. Continue to have big government because it has a trivial effect on the top twenty percent. The true fiscal conservatives out there are those who are saying everybody should pay. The William F. Buckley Jr. fiscal conservatives are those who are saying everybody has to contribute to the cost of government equitably. And then let's see what government, what, what we want government to spend, to, to pay for, what we want government to do. Once everybody has to contribute, then let's make a determination of what, of what government's gonna pay for. And it's gonna be a lot less. Once the top 20% have to contribute, the size and scope of government's gonna be a lot less. And, and the ADN and all of the others don't want that to happen. Right. They wanna contribute. Yeah. They want to continue to take it out of the out of the hands of middle and lower income Alaska families. I want to get to the Santos thing, but I I really I I mean I hate to I don't want to beat the dead horse. Actually, I do want to beat the dead horse. Um, but I, you know, here's what kills me, Brad. And I mentioned this earlier. All these organizations that got in there and you know shower put all these letters up from the different organizations that were in it. And what gets me is the various chambers. You know, the Fairbanks and the Peninsula and the, the Anchorage and the Alaska Chamber and all these things. And all I could think of is, you know what I really want to do? I really want to, I really, really want to run a campaign for smaller businesses to say, why are you members of an organization that is purportedly to protect your interest as small business? And yet they are then taking your monies and going and lobbying the government to put less money in the private sector, but instead put it back in the public sector. Why are you giving your money to these organizations? I mean, if I was a business owner that belonged to a, to you know the Fairbanks Chamber or the Wasilla or the Palmer or the whoever chambers, everybody that put letters in, I would be like, cancel my membership. I'm done with you. That's what I would do. And yes, they've got the big diamond and platinum level memberships for the big companies that are you know GCIs and the and the and the contractors and everybody else who's making money. Sure, well, see if you guys can live on just that. Because I'm done giving you my six or seven hundred dollars a year that I give you as a business to protect, because you are obviously not protecting my small business. Because all of those people that had gotten that money would have come into my business to spend money with me. Yeah, the, the irony about this, the irony about this is you you sort of see it. I mean, the the Alaska Chamber and the AFL CIO uh, combine uh, to push back on uh, on this budget. Uh, you know, they both claim to be, oh, they're fiscal conservatives. They want to reduce government government spending, which by which they mean the PFD. But but you really you really see what's going on. I mean, the AFL CIO is pushing back because they want to maintain money for uh, uh, government spending for government employees for their members. They want to maintain money for that without having to tap the top twenty percent because they know they'll be pushed back if they tap the top twenty percent. The chamber is in it for the very same thing. Not government employees, but government con- but government contracts spending on 
on the ports, spending on roads, spending on all the thing government, you know, the six hundred thousand dollars for for you know the friggin' uh, uh, diving boards. They're, they're, they want that government spending to, to, to continue, but they don't want the top 20% to have to pay for it. They want, you know, the costs continue to be pushed off on middle and lower income Alaska families who, who really don't have a voice down in Juneau. So everybody was combining for the same thing. Keep government spending going, you know, continue down the road of right. having all these government employees, continue down the road of having all these capital projects, continue down the road of of, you know, prepaying for oil and gas tax credits. My God, prepaying for oil and gas tax credits is in this budget. Continue down this road. Just make sure it comes out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. Just make sure the top 20% don't have to pay for it. And it's, you know, it, it all came out. If you read these letters with that understanding in mind, you see it across the board. Everybody, everybody is saying it's okay to continue government or in the AFL-CIO's case, in the Chamber's case, continue government spending, just don't make the top 20% pay for it. And again, um, <clears throat> the backbone of this state, um, it business-wise, there are the big companies. I mean, there are companies that make millions of dollars, but they are in the minority, the very small minority, like the 10% minority. 80, 85 to 90% of the businesses in this state are made up of small businesses with a very with a handful of employees making it happen. And yet these are the people that are funding these organizations that are, oh, well, you got to protect the very... I mean, I don't know a single business owner who would be happy with this. And... and <clears throat> If I had my druthers, there would be a campaign to highlight this to every business owner who belongs to one of these organizations. How could you do that? How? Why would you give money to these organizations that then, that that then to protect the economy, go ahead and cut all this money out of the economy to do it to give it back to the hands of politicians who are going to decide how to how to spend it and protect the top twenty percent of the state. Right. Right. Well, it's, you know, I, I talked to somebody this week who had been asked to join the Alaska Chamber and turned it down for this very reason, uh, who said, no, you guys are just, you know, you guys, he used a word I won't use on the air, but, but, you know, it, 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 it is, you guys are just out there pushing the same thing as the AFL-CIO. You're just pushing for government spending, government spending, government spending at my, at my expense. Right. You're just, you're, you're, you're making sure that government continues to, to grow big taking it out of my pocket. Uh, and, and no, I don't want to join your organization. So, you know, there are people out there that recognize it, not enough. I mean, part, part of what the chamber, not only does the chamber get money out of the small businesses, but it also gets numbers, right? So when they go to Juno, they're able to say, oh, we represent, you know, zillions of small of businesses in the state. You got to listen to us. You know, standing the fact they're working against most of their membership. Uh, but you know, they get, they get numbers out of it. So yeah, people need to push back. Uh, it, it, it's occurring in drips and drabs, but it would be, it would be helpful if more people did it. So if anybody here is listening on the uh, podcast or watching on the video this morning on Facebook, since we're in the break, if you know a business owner that belongs to a chamber that sent a letter, I recommend that you tell them and encourage them. Or if you're a business owner, send a letter and cancel your membership. Because this is the only thing that's going to get their attention. The only thing that affects them is when you hit their pocketbook. And if they lost 10 or 15 or 20% of their membership over something like this, it would be the only thing that would make them pay attention and start to focus on what's going on for small business. Forget about just protecting the large, protecting the small business. That's what those organizations are supposed to be about. Brad, I'm sorry I sucked up all your time here at the top of the hour here, but that that just it just frosts it just absolutely infuriates me that that's what's going on. Brad, we, we didn't get to number three again. All right, so we're gonna have to just deal with that. Uh, thank you so much for coming on board. As always, interesting analysis and discussions. Uh, we look forward to seeing what next week brings, my friend. We will. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on board. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.